Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, some of you may know, uh, last week, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navnita Pillay, visited Sri Lanka. It was the longest single country visit that she had made. And at the end of her visit, she made a remark at a press conference in a press statement where she said that Sri Lanka is moving increasingly towards authoritarianism. Once she left, in response to that, our president, President Mahindra Rajapaksa, said, how on earth could she possibly say something like that, and went on to cite the number of elections held in Sri Lanka since he became president. I suspect, therefore, my brief at this point is to kind of unpick that somewhat. And in order to do that, I'll give you a quick overview of the sort of situation of electoral democracy in Sri Lanka, because I think there are certain things that I do want to focus on. One is in terms of the structure of power, the institutions that come out of that, and also, very importantly, I think political culture. I think we would be making a great mistake if we were to treat electoral violence as a phenomenon of its own. And there are no real technical responses to it. It is part and parcel of a wider challenge of democratic representation and of a democratic political culture in all of our countries, with varying degrees of intensity, I suspect. Now, Sri Lanka, as you may know, is, I think, and correct me please if I'm wrong, the oldest Asian country to enjoy adult universal franchise, way back in 1931. And in that sense, we've been voting for the last seven decades. The second point that I want you to bear in mind is also that in Sri Lanka, there is no electoral law or any other law that recognizes election observation or monitoring. That is entirely at the discretion of the election commissioner, or election commission, as the case might be. Thirdly, Sri Lanka got independence in 1948 and was seen as a great model textbook Westminster-style democracy, changing governments frequently through the electoral process until the 1970s. There was no mass-based independence movement in Sri Lanka. Power was effectively passed by the colonial authority to a largely anglicized elite coming from all communities in the country. It was, and um, in effect it was, a gentleman's agreement. And the assumption, therefore, was that this anglicized elite had imbibed all the values and traditions of the colonial masters, and therefore you would have a textbook democracy, which we were all told we had, right up till the 19th 70s. That's also important precisely because there is no recognition, therefore, of a civil society space or civil society as key agents of change. The general perception in Sri Lanka at the end of the day is that political parties are the real agents of change, not civil society say, that it is political parties. And one of the biggest problems that we face with regard to political parties is that they are run like local fiefdoms. Yeah. And in a sense, you know, it is that old sort of dilemma. When they run their own political party as a fiefdom, how on earth do you expect them to run a government or a country with transparency, participation, inclusiveness, accountability, and whatever other virtues one cares to name. It's not possible, surely. It's logically impossible at one level, but that is the kind of conundrum that we have to deal with. Now, so we've been kicking our governments basically through the electoral process right to the 1960s. It is the 1970s, which is a crucial decade in our electoral and uh, democratic history, in that we first have a government coming into power with a two-thirds majority which changes the constitution of the country, turns us into a republic, entrenches the notion of Sri Lanka as a unitary state with one official language and, uh, in effect, one official religion, that of the majority community, 
and you lead to a situation in which you have the encouragement, the inception of real populist politics in the polity. That government came into power in 1970. It decided that after it changed the constitution, it had extended its term in office and therefore stayed in power for seven years, did not have elections. It was turfed out of office in 1977 by the opposition party with a 5-6 majority. And they stayed in power for 11 years, changing the constitution again. And this is a dramatic change in our constitutional history from a parliamentary system of government to a system of the executive presidency. That is an office that holds the entirety of powers. Who wins the presidency effectively governs the rest of the country. All other elections are basically immaterial, except for one incident in very rare circumstances that has been the case. The author of that constitution, President Jai Wadner, did make the famous statement that, look, the only power I do not have in this country is to change the sex of an individual. Now, that government in 1977 stayed on in office for 11 years. In those 11 years, we had an insurgency in the south of the country and an insurgency in the north of the country. The argument was, in effect, that the political establishment that had got independence was now corrupt and decrepit. The Ancien regime, as it were, had to go, and the only way one could kick it out was by bobbing oneself onto the agenda from outside of parliament. Parliament effectively becomes discredited as an arena, as a site for mediation of disputes in the 1970s. Real power play goes out into the streets. The AK-47 becomes, or the T-56, becomes more important than the vote. The insurgency in the South was crushed by tremendous anti-terror operations. The insurgency in the North, as you all know, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam held out for much longer, they were much stronger, all of that, and that finally ended in May 2009. But with tremendous repercussions for the polity at large because it did establish one simple thing, and that was that in a situation in which the structures of power and the institutions are seen to be corrupted by partisan politicization and where access is limited, the only way is to go out of parliament, outside of those institutions and processes, and engage in violence. The efficacy of violence is reinforced, and that continues to be a legacy. In much more practical empirical terms, of course, you have a situation, therefore, in which there's a huge proliferation of firearms in the population at large, which therefore has an impact on any kind of electoral contest as well. Yeah. So now we have a situation in which you have parties in power for at least a decade the United National Party, which brought in the Constitution in 1977, was in power for 17 years. The United People's Freedom Alliance, under a previous incarnation called the People's Alliance, has been in power since 1994. And the chances of it changing are quite remote, quite frankly, because at the present moment, what we have got is an effective dynastic project. I don't want to go into the, all, all the gory details, but basically we have a country run by a couple of brothers, and there are three sons as well to boot. They control 70% of the budget at least, uh, and they have 200 to 300 friends, relations, and assorted apparatchiks who have taken control of the state. So you have, in effect, state capture as well. Now, what's happening in all of this is that you have an absolute reinforcement of populist politics. Those at the very top who are wielding that power, and now, for example, if you take the current regime, its greatest claim to fame is the defeat of terrorism. And the poorer sections of the population who still look to the state as kind of protector and provider and are not really concerned if the state is predator as well. It's that alliance between the two. And what is being lost out in the middle 
And here globalization too, I think, has an impact in reinforcing this, is that the middle class sit at home and whinge about the state of democracy and governance and dream of getting out. And when they can, they do. So there is a major challenge here in terms of whether it be electoral violence or whether it be democratic reform, of getting a middle class, a bourgeois, in the classic sort of terminology of the French Revolution, re-engaged and romanticized by the whole experiment and experience of democratic politics. That's a key problem that we have. 